And after June of this year, or last year? Uh, after June of this year, I, this year. Yeah, I am employed there as a uh, deputy medical examiner, forensic pathologist. Okay. Um, what, are your, uh, what are your duties as a uh, assistant medical examiner? So as a deputy medical examiner, I am uh, tasked with performing autopsies uh, for the county and writing autopsy reports. Okay. And uh, approximately how many autopsies have you done in the last year and a half or so? I've done, so counting my uh, residency training, I've done 336 autopsies. Okay. And uh, how many of those were under the supervision of another medical examiner? Uh, 326 of them. So how long have you been doing the autopsies on your own? Uh, since July 1st. Of last of this, year? Of this year. Okay, so a couple weeks. A couple weeks. All right. Um, during the last year, uh, while you were a pathology fellow, uh, how did you conduct autopsies under the supervision of someone in the medical examiner's office? Uh, I'm sorry, can you be a little bit more specific? Sure. Um, as a fellow, are you tasked with performing autopsies yourself? Yes. Okay. And are you working alone or with one of the other assistant medical examiners? So I would perform the autopsies myself under the supervision of one of the other medical examiners in the office. Okay. And when conducting those autopsies, did that include photography? Yes, it did. And it included uh, drafting a report? Correct. Okay. Yes. And have you testified in court before? No, I have not. Um, this is your first time? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, based on his uh, training and uh, educational background, I would move to have Dr. Sullivan qualified as an expert in forensic pathology. No objection, Your Honor. We recognize him by the court as an expert witness. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, can you uh, briefly explain uh, what goes into performing an autopsy? Sure. An autopsy starts with an external examination whereby I look over the body um, and note any injuries, medical uh, therapy, uh, any scars or uh, identifying marks. I um, check the, uh, the status of the body in terms of rigor mortis and liver mortis and alver mortis, which are all um, uh, uh, conditions that a body goes through during decomposition. I then uh, open up the body and do, uh, by way of incisions and uh, eviscerate the body, look at uh, any injuries inside of the body, and uh, take samples for toxicology and histology. Do you perform the toxicology on those samples yourself? No, I do not. Where do those go? Those go to the, uh, the toxicology office at the Cuyahoga County um, Medical Examiner's Office. Now, when conducting an autopsy, uh, do you have a specific order in which you analyze things? Uh, yes, generally I start with an external examination, proceed to an internal examination, I go organ by organ, uh, dissecting, eviscerating and dissecting them, and then uh, uh, take samples of those for um, possible histological purposes, and at the same time uh, do samples for toxicology. Um, okay, so Dr. Sullivan then, when you memorialize uh, your autopsy into a report, uh, how do you generally organize that report? So I generally organize that report in the same way that I just described. I, I start with the external examination, uh, the internal examination, and then the microscopic description of my histology sections. And at the end of your autopsy, do you uh, determine a cause or manner of death? Yes, I do. Both? Yes. And what are the types of uh, uh, causes and manners of death? So causes of death are myriad. Um, manners of death are uh, in five categories, uh, homicide, suicide, natural, uh, accidental, or undetermined. Okay. And those are medical terms? Yes, they are. Okay. So accidental would have a different definition or could have a different definition uh, for medical purposes than for legal purposes? Yes. Okay. And uh, after you've memorialized your findings in the report, is the report peer-reviewed? Yes, it is. Okay. Did that process differ when you were a fellow as it does now as a full-fledged assistant medical examiner? Uh, yes. How so? Uh, all of my reports when I was a fellow were reviewed by the supervising uh, forensic pathologist. And then peer-reviewed again? Uh, and then peer-reviewed again by Dr. Gilson, the medical examiner. Yes. 
And just briefly, uh, the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office, does it, uh, is it a, a certified uh, medical examiner's office? Yes, it's uh, accredited by the National Association of Medical Examiners. Okay. And as far as you know, is that accreditation uh, current? Yes. Okay. Um, in November 19th of 2022 or thereabouts, uh, were you employed as a fellow in the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office? Yes. And did you have the opportunity to perform an autopsy on an individual by the name of Johnny Tetrick? Yes. And were you a fellow at the time? I was. And under whose supervision did you perform this autopsy? Under the supervision of Dr. Joseph Filo. Okay. Now, when you're performing this autopsy as a fellow, is Dr. Filo physically in the room with you? Uh, he at least is partially there. Okay. Um, and uh, did you memorialize those findings for the uh, autopsy of Johnny Tetrick into a report? Yes. All right. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Sorry. May I approach, Your Honor? May. We're going to do 200 and then 201 through 244, which they've stipulated to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first, first things first, um, Dr. Sullivan, did you have the opportunity then to photograph uh, Mr. Tetrick uh, during the performance of this autopsy? I personally did not photograph him, but a, a, forensic, a forensic photographer employed by Cuyahoga County did. Under your supervision? Under my supervision. And did you have the opportunity to review those photos? Yes, I did. Okay. I'm going to hand you what will be marked for identification purposes. The state's exhibit 201 through 243. Prior to coming into court, did you have an opportunity to review these photographs? Yes, I did. Okay. And uh, do you recognize that stack of photographs? Yes, I do. And are those a true and accurate depiction of the photographs taken in connection with the autopsy of Johnny Tetrick under your supervision? Yes. Okay. And um, we have a stipulation that they'll, they'll be admitted, but we are not going to, to publish them at this time, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to hand you what will be marked for identification, States Exhibit 200. Do you recognize States Exhibit 200? Yes, I do. And what is States Exhibit 200? Uh, this is the autopsy report that I generated from the autopsy of Johnny Tetrick. Okay. And pull it up here on the large screen. The uh, autopsy, is there an identification number uh, assigned to the uh, decedent in, in every case? Yes, there is. And what is the um, identification number in this particular uh, case? It would be on the top right, the case number IN2022-02105. Okay, and the first page of this is, is titled Report of Autopsy. Uh, what does this cover? So uh, this covers the uh, um, Basic, in the top portion, it covers the basic demographic information, and then uh, it lists the anatomic diagnoses that I had uh, discovered during the autopsy, and at the bottom it lists the, the cause and manner of death. Okay. And what was the cause and manner of death in this particular uh, instance? So the cause of death is uh, blunt force injuries. The manner of death was an auto-pedestrian accident, uh, hit skip while at work. Okay. And then... Auto pedestrian accident is again, that's a medical term? That is a medical term. Okay. And all right, I just would like to direct your attention then to page, uh, the, the following page for the gross anatomic description. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular section of an autopsy report, do you outline the injuries? Yes, I do. And in, in what order do you uh, report those? So in, in this case, I reported injuries grouped by anatomic location from uh, top to bottom, from, anti, uh, from superior to inferior, um, and then from external to internal. Okay, and when you say superior to inferior, what does that mean? Uh, top to bottom, uh, from the top of the head to the bottom of the head, from the top of the chest to the bottom of the chest. And during the course of an autopsy, do you identify uh, markings or evidence of recent therapy? Yes, I do. What type of things are those? Uh, those would be uh, intravenous catheters, any sort of uh, medical therapy uh, from chest tubes, uh, intraosseous catheters, uh, Foley urinary bladder catheters. So stuff that EMS or the hospital would have done prior to them coming in? Correct. Okay. And why is that noted? 
Uh, that's noted because it's on the body. Uh, it, uh, an autopsy is a comprehensive uh, evaluation of a, of a body, and those things being present need to be documented. What other uh, types of uh, body markings do you di uh, document for uh, that purpose? Um, so scars and tattoos would be documented for identification purposes. Now, um, what was the first grouping of injuries that you were able to uh, identify in this case? So uh, the first grouping of injuries uh, listed under external and internal evidence of recent injury would be injuries to the head and neck region. Okay, and could you take us generally through some of the more, you don't have to go through all of them, some of the more significant injuries to the head and neck region? Uh, sure. There were um, uh, laceration. There is a, um, the, probably the most significant injury was a um, s scattered subarachnoid hemorrhage of the superior left frontal cortex, which is uh, number three. What does that mean? Uh, that means that there was uh, blood on top of the brain. Okay. And was there evidence of a laceration uh, that was photographed and documented? Uh, yes, number 13, a uh, three-quarter inch long laceration on the right occipital scalp. Okay, where is that on the body? So that, that would be the right side of the back of the head. Okay, thank you. And the next grouping of injuries that you documented? Uh, those would be torso injuries. Okay, and what were some of the more significant injuries to the torso? Uh, th there were many here. Uh, the left lung was collapsed. There were two lacerations of the aorta, uh, which is the largest uh, blood vessel in the body. Uh, and uh, bilateral hemothoraces, which means blood pooled in uh, the left and right chest cavity. And uh, were, there, were there broken ribs as well? There were broken ribs as well. And uh, the next grouping of injuries that you would have documented? Uh, the next grouping would have been the, the extremities, starting with the right upper extremity, uh, of which there was only one abrasion, um, the left upper extremity, uh, the right lower extremity, and the left lower extremity. And any significant injuries there? Uh, these were mostly abrasions, uh, so scrapes to the body. Okay. Uh, any broken bones documented other than the ribs? Uh, uh, no. Um, was there any other uh, notable injuries that would have contributed to the, to the cause of death, other than what you've documented, or, I'm sorry, testified about? Um, that would be documented? Uh, no, but the, the, the documented blood force injuries would have been on the uh, anatomic diagnosis page, on the first page. All okay. of those would be. And, a, and again, the cause of death for Johnny Tetra? Blood force injuries. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Cross. Thank you, Your Honor. We have, we have no further questions for this. Please step down. Thank you very much. May I call your next witness? State of Ohio called Curtis Jones. Tommy swore you testify to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this you do is you swear I'm starting to get out of the pains and penalty perjury. I do. Good afternoon or good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Jones. Can you please state and spell your name for the court reporter? Curtis Jones, C-U-R-T-I-S-S-J-O-N-E-S. And Mr. Jones, are you employed? I am. By whom? The Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office. And how long have you been so employed? 23 years. And in what capacity are you employed by the Medical Examiner's Office? I'm the supervisor of the Trace Evidence Unit. Okay. And what is your training and experience? Stipulation. Uh, the stipulation would be that he's an uh, expert in trace evidence analysis. Very good. Thank you. All right, so Mr. Jones, uh, just briefly for the record, what is trace evidence? So trace evidence is a subdiscipline of forensic science. 
that uh, does two things, two types of exams, either examination of evidence that occurs in very small quantities, like a single fiber or a single hair, or it's a comparison of a known to an unknown. Say, for instance, a person was bound with duct tape. We can take those duct tape bindings, compare it to a roll of tape recovered from uh, subject's vehicle or house, and see if they were similar or not similar. Okay. Um, and what other, how do you do that, I guess? Well, it, it all depends on the condition of the material, but it can be anything from once it's collected to do a microscopic examination using various microscopes, microscopic techniques to determine features of the material. Then you can move into an instrumental analysis where you're either determining what elements are present, determining what components are present in a mixture. Uh, you can also do other testing. You can test for color and compare colors. And then you take all of that information together and you see um, if the features are similar or not similar. This type of examination is an examination of exclusion. So what you're doing in the examination is you're looking for a difference between the known and the unknown. And then if you perform all of your tests and you can't find a difference, the conclusion that you're left with is that they are the same or similar. Okay. And in terms of conducting your examinations, uh, do you memorialize those in a report? Yes. Okay. And is your report peer reviewed? It is. Okay. How many other uh, trace evidence analysts are there at the medical examiner's office? Uh, there are, there's a <clears throat> various levels of skill. There's a forensic scientist, forensic scientist three, there's two forensic scientist twos, and there's two forensic scientist ones. And who can review your work as the supervisor? Uh, any qualified forensic scientist who's qualified to perform the tests that are included in the report can do the review okay. after one year of uh, independent casework. Um, and you were so employed uh, last year in November, correct? I was, yes. And did you have the opportunity to uh, do some trace evidence uh, analysis on some evidence in connection with the uh, death of a firefighter named Johnny Tetrick? I did. Okay. And did you memorialize those in a report? Yes. Okay. Can I approach your honor? You may. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Mr. Jones, I'm going to show you uh, State's Exhibit 245. Do you recognize that? I do. Okay. And is that the report that you completed in connection with um, the Uh, death of Johnny Tetrick. It is. Okay. Now, when you're given things to analyze, how do you document what they are and determine what kind of test you're going to do? Uh, there's a description of the item. It's, each item is given an, an item number, uh, and then there's a description of what it is, whether we collect it ourselves and we put our description, or if it's submitted to us from an outside agency, then we'll describe what it is and then give the description of what the submitting agency said was either in the package or what the item was. And then if there's samples removed from an item, then it gets a, a point number, like it becomes a parent-child situation where you have an item that's number two. If you remove samples for further testing, those samples then become 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, so on. Okay. Now, in, in this particular case, how many items and what numbers did you analyze? Uh, there were actual items. There were 11 items, but there were a number of sub-items uh, and then sub-items off of those sub-items. So there was a number of items that were examined to include evidence collected from the body of the decedent, clothing of the decedent, a vehicle that was submitted, uh, as well as evidence collected from that vehicle, and then um, further evidence that we collected from the vehicle. Okay. 
Now, specifically for our purposes today, uh, Mr. Jones, I'd like to focus on items uh, at two, three, five, six, and nine. Uh, do you recall what item two is? I do. What was item two? Item two is actually uh, multiple items, but what it is is the clothing of Johnny Tetrick that was submitted by the uh, submitting agency. Okay. Specifically then, what was item 2.7? Uh, item 2.7 was a dark blue jacket. Okay. And what was item 3? Item 3 was a uh, white fractured polymer car part that was collected from the scene and submitted as evidence. Item 5? Item 5 was a second car part collected at the scene and submitted as evidence. Item 6? Item 6 was a third plastic or polymer car part that was submitted. Okay. Now what about item 9? Item 9 was a vehicle that was brought into our office so we could do an examination. Okay. And what was item, uh, sub item 9.1? Uh, 9.1 was a section from the passenger side bumper of the vehicle that had a blue transfer material on it. Okay. And was there a, a couple of sub items off of that then? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, may I approach your You may. I'm going to show you what will be marked for identification purposes as items 246 through 261. Do you recognize uh, these items? Can you take a look at them real quick? Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones, are those, uh, do you recognize those items? I do. What are they? Um, States exhibits 246 through 261 are photographs that were generated of evidence submitted in this case. Okay. And are they a true and accurate depiction of the photographs that you took or were taken at your direction? They are. Okay. So I want you to look at, uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, States exhibit 246. And what are we looking at in States Exhibit 246? Uh, States Exhibit 246 is an overall photograph of the front side of the um, dark blue jacket indicated as belonging to Johnny Tetrick. Okay, and that's item what? 2.7. Okay. States Exhibit 247? States Exhibit 247 is an overall photograph of the rear side of the dark blue jacket indicated as belonging to Johnny Tetrick. And is there a, uh, a marking that, that you've made on this particular item? There is. Okay, what is that? There's a six inch ruler placed kind of lower center of the rear side uh, showing the general location of um, not only what appeared to be uh, paint smears, but there's also a paint chip attached to the back of the uh, jacket. States 248. States Exhibit 248 is a close-up photograph of the paint chip that was attached to the jacket, which appears in the report as item 2.7.1. And 249. States Exhibit 249 is a second, even closer image of the um, paint chip attached to the jacket. Okay. And then did you analyze the paint chip that's uh, labeled item 2.7.1? I did. And how did you do so, and what were your findings? So it was analyzed both microscopically and instrumentally. So I prepared it for a microscopic examination. I looked at the number of layers that were present in the paint system, <laughs> cross-section of that, and looked at it under the microscope. Did some microscope techniques to look at various features of the paint. I then subjected each layer of the paint to instrumental analysis so to determine what components were present, what elements were there. And then I used that information to compare to the reference paint recovered from the uh, white vehicle submitted. And what were your findings? So the findings were um, that this paint chip <clears throat> was not similar to the paint from the hood of the vehicle. The, hood, the paint from the hood of the vehicle actually contained more layers than the layers of paint on this paint chip. 
And then when I compared it to the um, passenger side fender paint, it was found to be um, consistent in all measured features. Okay. Now, did you note that in the report? I did. And you have that listed as what? <clears throat> it's on page uh, seven. So there's then a conclusion reached in the report indicating that the white paint chip from the jacket uh, displays differences in layer structure as compared to the paint from the hood of the Chevy Malibu that's an elimination. And then the white paint chip from the jacket uh, was consistent in color, layer structure, physical characteristics, chemi chemical composition as compared to the reference paint from the passenger side fender, which puts it at a level three association. What does that mean? So what that means is <clears throat> in trace evidence, rarely because of the nature of trace evidence, and typically with trace evidence, you're dealing with manufactured products. So you're not dealing with unique things. You're, you're dealing with paints that are either a paint system applied to a series of vehicles or fibers that may be used in a, a various types of fabrics. So when we do the examination and reach a conclusion, we kind of grade the association. The, the smaller the number, the better the association. So like a level one is actually an individualization. So it's actually saying that this material came from this item. Whereas as the numbers increase, it's an indication that the population of material that you're looking at is large enough that other things may have that same paint and would essentially be indistinguishable from this paint chip. So that's just kind of a grading of the weight of the association. Thank you. And States Exhibit uh, 250. Uh, States Exhibit 250 is a photograph of what's in the report is item <coughs> three. So this is a polymer car part that was collected and submitted to the laboratory. And what was the analysis done on this? So this was then subjected to a physical match analysis. So we're taking this piece of car part and we're looking at the broken edges on this item as well as the broken edges on the vehicle itself and attempting to make what amounts to a, a jigsaw puzzle fit between the edges of this fractured piece of material and the damage on the vehicle. And we were able to physically match this piece of car part to the passenger side bumper of the vehicle, which is a level one association, a physical match. And 251? States Exhibit 251 is a second white car part uh, submitted as evidence. It appears in the report as item five. This had the same physical match analysis performed. This car part was able to be physically matched to the lower portion of the passenger side bumper. So it, again, is a level one association, a physical match. 252? States Exhibit 252 is a third uh, white polymer vehicle part submitted as evidence. It appears as item six in the report. This item was uh, subjected to a physical match analysis. This item did not directly physically match to the vehicle. It physically matched to items four and five, or three and five, which physically matched the vehicle, which made it a physical, physical match extension portion of the passenger side bumper of the vehicle. And another level one association? Yes. States 253? States Exhibit 253 is a overall photograph looking from the passenger front of the Chevy Malibu showing the damage to the uh, passenger fender and hood area. Is this uh, vehicle then what's listed as uh, item nine? Correct. 254? States Exhibit 254 is then uh, an image showing the front passenger side of the vehicle with the physical matches in place of items three and five. So that's with those pieces in there? Right. Okay. And States Exhibit 255. States Exhibit 255 is a close-up photograph of uh, the front passenger bumper area of the vehicle. 
In the lower left of the image is actually item three. Uh, and then what's the center of the image to include the, the blue transfer material is actually the vehicle. And you can see the physical match that runs kind of in an L shape from upper left to lower right corner between three and the vehicle. And then also this is a close up of the blue transfer material on the bumper of the vehicle. Were you able to perform additional analysis on the blue transfer material? I was. And what were your findings? So I examined that blue transfer material uh, and it was found to be composed of polyester and cotton. And then I compared that to um, the fabric from the pants, indicated as belonging to Johnny Tetrick and uh, this material was similar in what it's made out of polyester and cotton, as well as it was identical in the color compared to the pants of Johnny Tetrick. And what kind of association were you able to make with that? Uh, that was a level five association. States 256? States Exhibit 256 is a um, close-up photograph of um, <clears throat> the car parts uh, placed in a physical match comparison. Uh, I believe that's item six on the left and item five on the right of the image. States 257. States Exhibit 257 is a close-up photograph of the passenger side front of the vehicle kind of looking down on the bumper in the passenger side headlight housing area. Uh, in the lower part of the image showing the physical match, um, I believe that's between item three and nine. And then uh, in the upper portion of the image, there was an area where there was some transfer material, some blue, dark blue and yellow. 258. States Exhibit 258 is a close-up photograph of the passenger side of the vehicle from the hood and passenger side headlight. There's a small ruler in the image, and in the area of the ruler was some dark blue transfer material and some yellow transfer material. 259, is that a close-up? It is, and now you can actually you see a lot easier. Uh, above the two-inch ruler to the right is some blue transfer material, and not as easy to see, but towards the center of the ruler is the yellow transfer material. 260. And then States Exhibit 260 is an even more close-up image where you can see well the blue, dark blue transfer material towards the right of the image and the yellow transfer material towards the center of the ruler above. And 261. States Exhibit 261 uh, is a close-up photograph of an area of the metal panel uh, passenger side fender area. There were some fibers collected from that area that were analyzed. And were the, was there any association made with those fibers? There was not. Uh, take, I'm sorry, taking one step back, uh, item 9.2 here. Uh, were you able to make any associations with regard to the, uh, the blue transfer material and the yellow transfer material? I was. And what was that? So the dark blue transfer material was removed and analyzed and found to be composed of nylon. That was compared to the jacket, or the dark blue jacket of Johnny Tetrick, and was found to be of the same material as well as identical in color and was given a level five association. And then the yellow transfer material was compared to the safety vest of Johnny Tetrick and was found to be composed of the same material and was identical in color as the material that the safety vest was composed of. Um, are all of these findings that you've made to a reason, reasonable degree of scientific certainty based on your training and experience? In that, it was performed, the testing was performed according to standard and operating procedures. Uh, the instrumentation that was used passed checks necessary to be able to use that in instrumentation and any positive negative controls that may have been performed within the case had results that were as, as expected. Thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for coming down. Your Honor, we don't have any questions. Please go ahead. Step down. Thank you.
You know, I have the state of Ohio we call uh, Marissa Esterline. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear you have testified to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this you do as you go on turning God on pains and penalty of perjury. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Esterline. Can you please state and spell your name for the court reporter? Marissa Esterline. M-A-R-I-S-S-A-E-S-T-E-R-L-I-N-E. -S -S -E -E. Are you employed? Yes, I'm currently a forensic scientist at the Cuyahoga County Regional Forensic Science Laboratory. And how long have you been so employed? Um, approximately 11 years. And uh, what is your training and experience? Upon being hired in at this laboratory, I was um, hired as a DNA technician where I underwent training in forensic serology. M Ms. Esterline, we have a stipulation to your qualifications as a DNA okay. analyst, uh, as an expert in DNA analysis. Okay. Thanks. Um, just briefly for the record, uh, can you explain what DNA is? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Its molecule housed inside the nucleus of your cell it's inherited at the time of conception. So half comes from your mother, half comes from your father. This combination between the two creates a sequence that is unique between individuals with the exception of identical twins. Okay. And um, how is, uh, what do you do as a DNA analyst at the Cuyahoga County Regional Forensic Laboratory? I process samples that are submitted to us either um, from bodies or from crime scenes. I process those through the lab to develop DNA profiles, which are then used to compare to known profiles to determine the source of origin of that unknown. And do you collect the samples yourself or are they submitted to you? It can be either. It can be submitted to us um, either from the medical examiner side of the office or it can be submitted to us by the agency. And if it comes from the medical examiner side, do you collect the sample or does that come from another part of the lab? That typically comes from the trace evidence department. Okay. And where do known samples come from? Those are collected from known individuals, often in the form of a buckle swab, which is swabbed from the inside of a person's cheek. Okay. And uh, once you receive these samples that are to be tested, and once you have a known sample, what do you do? The samples are screened and cut into individual tubes and processed through multiple steps within the laboratory to develop those profiles to then be used for interpretation. Okay. And how does interpretation work? Interpretation, we first look at the unknown profiles to determine if it is possibly single source or a mixture. And then depending on that, moving forward with how many it's possible to be in that profile. In our lab, we use a software called TrueAllele to process those unknowns. And those are processed and then compared to known standards to determine a statistical likelihood that they that the unknown originated from the known. Okay, well let's start here. What's a, a single sample? A single source sample? Or a single source, I'm sorry. Originated from one individual. There's only evidence of one person in that profile. And a mixture? A mixture is any indication of more than one. And uh, when you say you develop likelihood ratios when there's a, uh, a mixture, what does that mean and how does that work? A likelihood ratio is a comparison of the probability that the unknown profile developed from the person of interest compared to the probability that the unknown profile originated from an unrelated unknown individual. So once you received these samples and you performed your analysis, you develop your statistical likelihood ratios, uh, do, you, um, do you reduce your findings uh, to a report? Yes. Okay. And is that report peer reviewed? Yes, it is. By whom? 
another qualified analyst within our laboratory. Okay. And um, did you have the opportunity uh, in November or after November of last year to perform a DNA analysis on uh, items submitted in connection with the uh, death of an individual by the name of Johnny Tetrick? Yes. Okay. May I approach your honor? Right. Now, Ms. Esterline, uh, did you, after performing uh, DNA analysis uh, in that particular case, did you memorialize your findings in a report? Yes. I've handed you what's marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 262. Do you recognize that? This is the DNA laboratory examination report in which I authored in our lab case number 2022-010228. Okay, and I know that we have a stipulation of your qualifications, but is the Regional Forensic Science Laboratory an accredited uh, DNA uh, lab? Yes, it is. Okay, and it maintains its accreditation year in and year out? Yes. Okay. Um, referring to the large board then, what items were submitted to you for DNA analysis? Items 9.5, 9.6, 9.7, 9.8, and 9.9 .9 were transferred by the Trace Evidence Unit on November 22nd, 2022. And items 12 and 13 were received from the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office on November 21st, 2022. Okay, and um, what were items 12 and 13? 12 and 13 are DNA standards from Johnny Tetrick. Okay, and are those the standards by which you did a comparison with the DNA uh, from the other items submitted? Yes, one of these is a blood stain card taken from his blood, and another is the buckle swab taken from the inside of his cheek. And in this case, I used the blood stain card for his standard. Okay, why? They both have the, C the same DNA, so I used the number that was first. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, and can you just take us through your uh, results and conclusions? What was, what was sub-item 9.5? 9.5 is swabs from the damaged area on the front hood slash bumper. Are you familiar with how those swabs are taken? These swabs were transferred to us from Trace Evidence, so I personally did not collect these swabs. Okay. Um, but they were taken from the hood? Yes, the hood bumper. Okay. And what were the findings? The DNA profile obtained from item 9.5 is a mixture. A likelihood ratio was calculated assuming item 9.5 contained DNA from three unknown contributors. A match was identified between item 9.5 and Johnny Tetrick. This match is 40 billion times more probable than a coincidental match to an unrelated African American person, 2.65 billion times more probable than a coincidental match to an unrelated Caucasian person, and 5.47 billion times more probable than a coincidental match to an unrelated Hispanic person. What does that mean? So this comparison, um, the unknown had three contributors that we could see. And after analyzing that sample, a match was identified, meaning that one of those three contributors was consistent with the DNA of Johnny Tetrick, and that likelihood is approximately 40 billion times more likely that it originated from Johnny Tetrick than that it originated from an unknown individual. Okay. And those uh, would be for then different races of individuals, the likelihood under the same circumstances? Yes, it uses population databases from three different populations. What about item 9.7? 9.7 was swabs from the back of the passenger side view mirror. The DNA profile obtained from item 9.7 is a mixture. A likelihood ratio was calculated, assuming item 9.7 contained DNA from three unknown contributors. Due to insufficient genetic information, match support for Johnny Tetrick to item 9.7 is inconclusive. What does that mean? So in this case, one of the unknown contributors um, presented a slight positive association to Johnny Tetrick, but it was not a strong enough positive association to cross our threshold to call it a match. And directing your attention to page two, uh, items 9.8 and 9.9. .9. Uh, was there any statistical support for a match between those two items and Johnny Tetra? No. Okay. And what about item 9.6? 
An insufficient quantity of human DNA was detected in item 9.6. No further testing was performed at this time. Okay. And so what does that mean? One of the steps during this process is a quantification step where we determine how much DNA is present within our sample. And based on internal validations, we have a threshold that must be present for us to take forward to develop a profile. So in this sample, a small amount of DNA was seen, but not enough for us to process and develop a profile. Okay. Um, were all of these tests performed within the uh, uh, standard operating procedures and, and uh, standards that you, you hold in the medical examiner's office? Yes, they were. And uh, based on, on that, as well as your training and experience, uh, are these findings to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes. Okay. Nothing further. Please step down. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, the State of Ohio will call Sergeant Tim O'Hare. Why don't we take a short recess? I can imagine he's going to be a little bit longer. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Judge.
Why don't you go out there and let them know we're starting up, please, if you want to come back in. You know you'd have to hear all those stupid stories. Wrong one. Oh, was it the one? No, the other one. Oh, oh. Bill fine. Don't worry about it. He would understand. I know I'm in some chair too. What? Work for him. Hear him all. Oh, I sat on a journey room for two weeks as a VG. How about that? Call your next witness. Steve Ohio calls uh, Sergeant Tim O'Hare. You solemnly swear you'll testify to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this you do is you swear answer the guy that paints the penalty of perjury? I do. Maybe you see. Hey, Depp, wait a minute. All right, good morning, Sergeant O'Hare. Can you please state and spell your name for the court reporter? Timothy O'Hare, O apostrophe, H A I R E. And are you employed? Yes. By whom? Uh, the village of Bratnall. And in what capacity are you employed by the village of Bratnall? I'm a patrol sergeant for the uh, police department. And how long have you been a? Uh, how long have you been with the Bratnall Police Department? Uh, coming up on ten years now, sir. And were you a? Are you a duly sworn peace officer in the state of Ohio? Yes. And prior to your employee with the village of Bratnall, did you work as a police officer anywhere else? I did. Where at? The uh, village of, I uh, started with uh, Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority Police, uh, went to the village of Newburgh Heights Police Department, and then the village of Putin Bay. I'm sorry, village of? Put in Bay. Put in Bay. And uh, as a sergeant, uh, what do you do at Bratnall? Uh, I'm responsible for uh, overseeing and supervising uh, my shift, um, responding for calls for service, uh, crime prevention, crime investigation. Does Bratton all have a detective bureau? We do not. So uh, that's where your investigation comes in? Yes, sir. And uh, do you have the opportunity to uh, investigate auto accidents uh, within the village of Bratton all? I do. And on November the 19th of 2022, uh, were you called in to be the primary investigator on uh, the death of Cleveland firefighter Johnny Tetrick? I received a phone call uh, saying that we had had a firefighter struck on the highway and that he had died. Uh, unfortunately, I was out of town, so I was not able to make it to the scene or into the village until early the next morning. Okay. And uh, when you arrived on scene the next morning or in Bratton all the next morning, take us through your investigation and what you did when you got in. Uh, I started by on my way back, I was uh, in contact with investigating off with the other officers. Um, with uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation and received their video um, of the scene and the uh, events leading up to it. 
um, on my way back. And then once I got back, I reviewed that video and then began reviewing uh, video from our officers from the scene. Okay, how many Bratnall officers approximately were on the scene that night? Uh, on scene at the time of the incident were two. Okay, which ones? Uh, officer Howard and Officer Nagy. And were other Bratnall officers involved in the subsequent investigation of this case? Yes. Who? Uh, officer Garris uh, responded to the scene and then also responded to the location where the vehicle was later found. Um, Chief Labello and Lieutenant Sorek and Officer Meehan also assisted, and okay. Officer Wonek. And did you reach out and speak with any other law enforcement agencies in connection with this investigation initially? Yes, uh, the City of Cleveland. Okay. And when you came in, uh, what did you learn or what was the status of, of the investigation at the time? Uh, when I got into work, uh, the status of the investigation was that um, we had activated as the Eastside Department Group Enforcement X Investigation Unit. They'd come to the scene, photographed it um, with uh, collaboration with the City of Cleveland the IU team. They were able to document the scene, take uh, measurements. Um, they then, through the uh, work of Cleveland detectives and our officers, were able to identify a vehicle, uh, locate the vehicle at a residence, and had detained and arrested uh, Leander Bissell. Now, at that point in time, uh, what did you do next in furtherance of the investigation? Uh, my initial step was to review the video from the scene, start to share that with the other law enforcement agencies that were involved in the city of Cleveland, so that then we could work back and get more video outlining where the path of the vehicle's travel was from the scene to where it was located at the residence. Okay, so when you, were, when you had arrived uh, and began your investigation, what video was already in your possession? I had Officer Howard's dash camera and body camera, Officer Nagy's dash camera, and the ODOT uh, video of the scene from MLK. Okay. And did you come to learn that there was a truck driver who had video of the collision as well? I did. And was that already in your possession? Uh, I got it later on that day. Okay. So uh, at that time, what other, what other video or evidence following a path were you seeking to obtain? Uh, oh, Cleveland's real-time crime cameras and ODOT camera footage from farther down the highway showing where the vehicle went after the collision with Johnny Patrick. And was that subsequent ODOT video useful? Yes, it was. And uh, did you obtain then the real-time camera footage? We did. And did you, uh, what did you do after you obtained all that video uh, on your first day back? I reviewed it and then determined the path of the vehicle and uh, its actions leading up to the uh, crash from when it first appeared on video. Okay. What were you able to determine from that video? Uh, I was able to determine that it arrives on scene uh, in the number one high speed lane of the highway. It approaches a stationary Cleveland uh, police vehicle in the number two lane. It goes to the right of the uh, Cleveland police vehicle. It then enters into the number two lane directly in front of the Cleveland police vehicle, begins accelerating, approaches a secondary Cleveland police vehicle that was also in the number two lane, straddling number one and number two, I should say. Uh, it approaches the rear of that vehicle, stops behind it momentarily, and then goes to the left of that police vehicle between the center Jersey barrier wall and the stationary police vehicle with its lights activated. It then accelerates again, uh, passes a second, um, sorry, passes another police vehicle, a Bratnall police vehicle this time, on the left hand side between the wall and the police vehicle that was stopped in the number one and two lanes. It then disappears momentarily behind an ODOT sign on the highway. It approaches a fourth police vehicle, uh, Patrolman Howard's vehicle that was stationary in the number one lane behind the crash, the overturned vehicle from the previous accident. Uh, as it approaches this final police vehicle, it goes to the right of that vehicle, entering lane two, passing the um, overturned vehicle, and at that time it struck uh, firefighter Johnny Tetrick. And your subsequent review of video after that, were you able to determine a path of this vehicle? I was. It continued east on 90, uh, passing Eddy Road. It uh, exited the freeway at the Lakeshore Boulevard exit ramp. Uh, then on Lakeshore Boulevard, we observed it uh, traveling east on, on Lakeshore Boulevard near East 152nd. It made a right-hand turn onto East 152nd, 
and then a left hand turn onto rid path from there. Okay. So after reviewing that video, uh, did your investigation show that you already had a car in Bratnall's possession? We did. Okay. Did you uh, have an opportunity then to view and take a look at the car? I did. Okay. What did you do after that? Uh, after that, we uh, confirmed that the vehicle matched at least visually to the vehicle that was seen on camera. Uh, we then I attempted to, we obtained a search warrant for the vehicle for trace evidence and for downloading the airbag control module. Uh, I attempted to download the airbag control module. However, what, what is an airbag control module? An airbag control module is basically, um, think of it as like a black box of an airplane, but for your car, it just doesn't have as many cool features as an airplane does. It doesn't record as many things. Depending on the year of the vehicle, um, the newer the vehicle, the more sensors it has, the more information you can obtain from it. Do you have any specific training in uh, reviewing accident uh, control modules? I do. And where, where did you get that training and what, uh, what did you learn? Through the Eastside Department Group Enforcement uh, AIU team, we uh, train on the uh, Bosch, uh, it's the crash data recorder uh, software, and we learn how the proper way to connect the system, uh, the proper techniques for mm -hmm. downloading the data from the uh, airbag control module and then also how to interpret and read the uh, results that we obtain. Well, how do you do that? So it depends on the year of the vehicle. In this case, the vehicle was an older vehicle. 2004 was one of the first years supported by this uh, airbag control module system. So in this case, the data that we got was only a uh, longitudinal deceleration. What does that mean? It means that uh, longitudinal versus lateral. Longitudinal means forward and back. Lateral means side to side. <laughs> In this case, uh, subsequent download of the vehicle revealed a two mile an hour slowing of the vehicle, but no actual airbag uh, deployment. Okay. And when you say a two mile an hour slowdown of the vehicle, what, what do you interpret that to mean? Uh, it means that it struck some object that slowed the vehicle in a near instantaneous manner. Okay. And what type of, are you able based on the data you recover from the crash data report able to determine a, uh, a speed at time of impact? Uh, typically not in a pedestrian impact. Okay. Uh, were you able to determine how fast this car was going approximately? Yes, based on uh, after we created a scale diagram of the uh, accident scene, including the area of impact and uh, final rest of where Firefighter Tetrick's uh, body um, came to rest after being thrown by the vehicle. Uh, that distance ended up being 102 and a half feet. Uh, from there, we used a formula known as the uh, flat face uh, projection without upward trajectory. What does that mean? It means that uh, it's a, an equation known in accident uh, reconstruction and investigation that uses known science that shows the trajectory and um, amount of force needed to provide distance that the uh, body traveled both in the air and sliding across the ground. Okay. And what is a flat, what did you call it? A uh, flat face throw. Okay, what is that? So there's two different types of uh, pedestrian impacts. You're gonna have either a flat face throw or a uh, sural projection. Uh, sural projection is typically used when a uh, body is upright and is struck and then comes onto the hood of the vehicle and then is projected off. Um, whereas flat face throw would be used for if uh, the front of the vehicle is taller or flatter, uh, in this situation, we used the flat face throw because at the time, as found on video, uh, off, uh, firefighter Tetrick was bent over, so his body did not wrap onto the hood as you would see when we would use a sural projection, and instead we used the flat face throw. Do you know why his body wasn't thrust upward? Uh, because of the fact that since he was bent over, he did not impact an area that provided an angle for him to launch upward. Instead, he was just basically pushed forward. So. Uh, based on that analysis and the fact that he was thrown 102 and a half feet, were you able to determine approximately how fast the vehicle was traveling at the time of impact? I was. And how fast was that? Uh, my calculations came out to about to approximately 49 miles per hour. And after you did the crash uh, data analysis then from the, from the vehicle, were you able to, uh, what, would, what, what did you do next in furtherance of your investigation? Um, we packaged the vehicle for transport to the uh, medical examiner's office for trace evidence. Uh, the way we did that was uh, tarping the vehicle to make sure that no trace evidence could be removed or uh, 
contaminated during transportation. And after transferring the vehicle, uh, how did your investigation proceed? Uh, I obtained search warrants for um, Mr. Bissell's cell phone that had been obtained the night of his arrest. Okay. And what else? Uh, also began um, reviewing the video showing the path. And then, um, excuse me, sorry. Uh, began interviewing, uh, after I obtained the search warrant for the phone, I got the phone back, uh, reviewed text messages between him and other people that night. Okay. And uh, did you have the opportunity then to uh, get a search warrant for Mr. Bissell's home? We did. When? Uh, after Officer Wonay obtained video from the apartment building across the street from uh, Bissell's apartment, and entering and exiting his vehicle before and after uh, the crash. Okay. So did Officer Monet go out and get that video at your request? He did. Okay. And did you analyze that video yourself after he brought it back to the department? I did. Okay. What was your analysis of that video and how did you analyze it? Uh, Review the video of uh, observed when he left the uh, apartment, uh, noting the clothing he was wearing and the uh, state of the vehicle, noting the lack of damage to the front right corner, uh, and then reviewed the video of him returning after the crash time and noticing that and observed that uh, he was wearing the same clothing as when he had left, not wearing the same clothing, and that he then, uh, as he was parking the vehicle on Red Path, he actually pulled in, ran into a vehicle in front of him, it appears, backed up, got out of his car for a short amount of time, got back in the vehicle, sat in the vehicle for a few minutes, and then got back out of the vehicle and walked into the uh, common shared uh, door for the, his apartment complex. Okay. Now, at the time you obtained ODOT video, <clears throat> is the ODOT video time stamped? It is. Okay. And based on all of the other circumstances. Timestamps on the ODOT. From the apartment across the street on Red Path. There was. And we heard testimony yesterday, you were here from Officer Monet, uh, that he believed it was approximately an hour and six minutes. Couldn't remember one way or another. Did you do your own analysis of that timestamp and compare it to the other video and make a finding? I did. Uh, I determined that the video was actually 54 minutes fast. Okay. And uh, what was your determination, or how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, by comparing it to no time of when Cleveland police arrived, first when they appear on video, and then also um, knowing that had, having Officer Wone mark down, not mark down the time, but tell me the time that he uh, observed the video versus the actual time, to, the actual time that he observed the video live video and the time displayed on the timestamp. Okay. And after you obtained that video, uh, I'm sorry, so you you then executed a search warrant? We did. What were you searching for? Uh, clothing that uh, Leander Bissell was wearing at the time of uh, the crash and when he exited the vehicle because at the time of his arrest he was not wearing the same clothing. Okay. Uh, may I approach her? May. Your Honor, I'm going to show the uh, witness what will be marked for identification. It states 350 to 398. Uh, Sergeant O'Hare, have you reviewed these photos before? Yes. Are these the photographs you took in connection with the search warrant that was executed uh, on Ridpath? Yes. And um, are they a true and accurate copy of the photographs that were taken in connection with that search warrant? Yes. And. Uh, did you, in fact, collect clothing of a similar nature to that displayed in the video we saw yesterday? Yes. Now, after executing that search warrant, how did the investigation proceed? Uh, from there, we said we got the uh, cell phone back from the uh, Secret Service with a forensic uh, dump 
so that we were able to review uh, text messages and other um, things that uh, call logs, things like that from the cell phone. Okay. Now, were you able to determine a general area from where Mr. Bissell uh, may have been coming at the time the collision with uh, Firefighter Tetrick occurred? We were. Okay. And do you know what part of town he was coming from? Uh, the Tremont area. Okay. Would that be on the west side? It is. And uh, based on your training and experience and, and, and living in Cuyahoga County, uh, if one lived in the area of East 152nd Street, would one take Interstate 90 through the MLK area on the way home from the west side? It would be the most direct route. Okay. Now, you mentioned that the first thing you did in furtherance of this investigation was call ODOT. Correct. Why would you call ODOT? They have a series of cameras uh, positioned along the interstates that record um, constantly recording vehicle movement, travel, things like that, and knowing where the accident occurred and knowing that there is a camera located right there at the MLK overpass. It was probable that we would have been able to get some video footage. And were you able to obtain some video footage prior to the collision? Yes. And approximately how much video did you request and how much video did you get? Uh, we requested as much as we could. So we got it from basically arrival of, um, prior to the arrival of engine 22 through after the collision. Okay. And uh, if I showed you an excerpt from that video, would you recognize it? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to show the witness what will be marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 2. Sergeant O'Hare, just as a, as a start here, of course. Sergeant O'Hare, do you recognize uh, State's Exhibit 2? I do. And what are we looking at here? Uh, this is a ODOT video camera footage from uh, the 19th of November of last year, uh, facing east from the MLK overpass. Okay, is there a timestamp on there? There is. What timestamp is that? 2020-17. Uh, and uh, in layman's terms, in non-military time? Uh, 8.20 p.m. Now, Sergeant O'Hare, um, how familiar are you with uh, ODOT's camera system? Uh, pretty familiar. Are they manned? Uh, they are not, they're not typically manned 100% of the time, but when any time there's an incident, um, ODOT will be notified and then they, an operator can go live onto that camera and start uh, manipulating it because it is a pan tilt zoom camera. What does that mean? Uh, it means that the operator can take control of the camera, zoom it in, move the head so that it's facing and uh, focusing on different areas. Okay. Now, I'm going to play for you the rest of uh, Exhibit 2. If I could ask you, Sergeant O'Hare, when there are points of relevance to this case, if you could just let me know and I'll stop and we can explain it, okay? Sounds good, sir. Thank you. Now, this is uh, engine 22 arriving on scene and approaching the uh, location of the first accident. And that would be in lane one? Correct. And this is uh, time stamped 
at 2021-09 for the record and 54 seconds into State's Exhibit 2. Okay, pausing the video at a minute and 35 or 37 seconds. Um, what just happened with this video? Uh, an ODOT operator in their uh, camera center was most, lowly, most, I'm sorry, most likely notified that there is a crash on the highway and they've uh, moved the camera to get a better look at the uh, area. Okay, so is this a, it's fair to say it's just zoomed in on the same area? Correct. Okay. I'm going to pause this here at a minute 52. Sergeant O'Hare, are you able to determine, and Aaron, can I have the witness step down? Okay. Can you come down and point out where, if any, uh, law enforcement is positioned along the lanes of the highway? Uh, here in lane two, we have a Cleveland police vehicle. Uh, this blur on this current, because the camera's not adjusting well on the emergency lights flashing, we have an additional Cleveland police vehicle. Uh, we here and then a police vehicle here and then here. And uh, where is fire engine 22 in uh, accordance with this video? Uh, they've now arrived right in front of these police vehicle and the overturn vehicle in this area. Okay. And do you recall where the Bratnall police officer is or the police car is? Uh, one of them is this current uh, large bright blue balloon and the other one is here. Okay. Thanks. You can have a seat. Actually, you know what? Why don't, why don't you stay here? Because I'm probably going to ask you to come down again. Uh, if you could just step to the to the right side for now. Okay. Resuming the video at 153. I paused the video at two minutes eleven seconds and twenty twenty two twenty five on the timestamp. What is uh, why are we stopping here? Uh, this vehicle, this white one that just entered the uh, view in lane one, is uh, the uh, white Chevy Malibu driven by the Andrew Bissell. Okay. Now, Sergeant O'Hare, I'm going to let this play through, and then I'll come back to two eleven and break it down. You can just point out for the judge which car we're still looking at. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to keep going. Sorry.
Okay, I'm going to pause this here at 347. Have we seen the car go all the way through at this point? We have. And are there other emergency personnel now visible in the video at this point? There are. What? Uh, here we have uh, fire rescue vehicle. I don't remember which number. And then here we have Medic 40 entering the highway from the And those are the two vehicles that we saw in uh, Mr. Nelson's dash camera? Okay, now I'm going to go back to, I think it was, I said two minutes and 11 seconds, I believe it was. We'll start at 2.03. When you see Mr. Bissell's vehicle, please stop me. Now. Okay, can you point for the judge which vehicle we're looking at? This vehicle, sir. Okay. Um, take one step back so I can see. Thank you. Um, all right. Now, I want you to kind of follow with your finger this vehicle as it proceeds through so the judge can see exactly what we're looking at. So as we're watching this, Sergeant O'Hare at 243, what is Mr. Bissell's vehicle doing? Uh, he just changed lanes from the number one lane to the number two lane while approaching uh, stationary Cleveland, Public, uh, Cleveland Police vehicle that's lights flashing. Okay. And now what are we doing here at three minutes eight? Uh He's beginning to merge to the right again from two to three to go around the vehicle that is stopped in lane two. Is he at this time merging in with the rest of traffic? Yes. And now what's he doing? Uh, he's now cut of the police vehicle into the closed number two lane, accelerating past the stop traffic. Okay. And now here at 320? Uh, he's approaching the rear end of the stationary uh, police vehicle that is stopped in the number two lane. He goes between the vehicle and the wall. Again, begins to accelerate, passes a Bratnall police vehicle here, goes to the right of another stationary vehicle, uh, firefighter contract, and then left the scene. Okay, now can you take one step back? I want you to keep an eye on that first Cleveland police car that Mr. Bissell passed to the right. At this point in time, Mr. Uh, Tetrick has been hit, correct? Correct. And what is that first stationary police vehicle doing? Uh, it's leaving the scene, I believe, to uh, attempt to stop Mr. Bissell. Okay. Is that the one we later see drive through the, uh, drive through the accident scene ahead of the ambulance? It is. And are you able to see Mr. Nelson's truck? in this video? I did. Okay, where is he at? Uh, Mr. Nelson's truck is this uh, stationary white truck here. Okay. All right, you can have a seat. Now, Sergeant O'Hare, it's your testimony that uh, based on your training and experience in calculating uh, the, the speed at, at about 49 miles an hour at impact? Yes. Okay. And that's, again, after he moves to the left of that second stationary police vehicle? Uh, the speed would be calculated at the time of impact. Right, but I'm saying it's, it's after he's passed that second vehicle. Correct. Correct. And, okay, so you called ODOT first, you obtained this video. Yes, sir. You also obtained subsequent ODOT videos further down the freeway? Correct. And that supported the direction in which Mr. Bissell passed? Correct. Okay. Um, you said you also reviewed body cams from the officers on scene. I did. Uh, you reviewed dash cam as well. Correct. Okay. I'm going to show you what will be marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 1A. 
Do you recognize States Exhibit 1A? I do. And what is States Exhibit 1A? Uh, this is the uh, dash camera recording from a uh, police vehicle driven by Patrolman Howard that night. And was Patrolman Howard's vehicle the last Bratnall police car that you pointed out kind of its general vicinity in States Exhibit 2 as the last one before the overturned vehicle? I did, yes. Okay. Are you able to determine from this angle, and I paused the video here at uh, 12 seconds, the direction in which that white Chevy Malibu was traveling? Yes. Okay, and, and, and what, if, if, what lane was it in? It was in the number two lane. Okay. I want to back this up just, just a little bit. Prior to the collision, is it fair to say there's traffic moving through at this time? There is. And are you able to determine from this angle what lanes those traffic uh, is moving? I am. And, and what lanes are those? Uh, numbers three and four. Okay. And just based on your own eye test, are any of those vehicles traveling as fast as the white Malibu? No. Now, was Officer Howard uh, at his vehicle at this time? He was not. Where was Officer Howard located? Officer Howard was across the highway behind the uh, black pickup truck. And just for purposes of the record, we have a stipulation of both this dash cam and Officer Howard's body cam as he's unavailable. And did you review Officer Howard's body cam? I did. I'm going to show you what will be marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 1B. Do you want me to turn that down a little bit, Judge? Are you, uh, can you set the scene for us a little bit here? Uh, Officer Howard is speaking with the driver of the uh, overturned vehicle from the previous crash. Okay, and is there a timestamp on his body cam? There is. It's, what, uh, what time is that? 20, 21, 56, or 8, 21 p.m. And based on uh, your experience, are these accurate times on the Bratnell body cams? They are. What's, what's my opinion? I don't even know. It's not on the highway. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to pause this video at 15 seconds in. What did we just see? Uh, engine 22 arriving on scene. Okay. And there's another individual in a plaid shirt. Do you know who that is? Uh, that was the driver of the black truck. I believe he's an off-duty Cleveland police officer. Okay. Okay, at 46 seconds, we just see a Cleveland police officer come up and say, is this us or you? Are you familiar with what that conversation was about? Yes, sir. Uh, due to the fact of where the location of the initial crash occurred, it was right on the border of uh, Bretonall and the city of Cleveland. Uh, 